Um, so this evening's discussion uh, is um, about Yakshi Myorai, or the Medicine Buddha. Um, and for a little bit of background, uh, at least for myself personally, uh, this was one that I really wanted to do. Um, and mostly because I've been staring at the Yakshi Myorai Onzon, the image that we have in our temple, since its consecration, what, uh, more than 15 years ago? Maybe 17, 17 years 18, ago. yeah. Um, and I've known some general things about Yakshi Nyorai, Baijia Jaguru, but not necessarily a whole lot of particular detail. So uh, when I walk into the Hondo and I bow, I just wanted a much fuller appreciation about our particular Honzon. So welcome to that. Um, <laughs> It's, it's important for us to know about these figures um, that we may or may not have on our altars. Um, and if not, that's fine. But if you do have one, um, take the opportunity to learn about the particular Honzon that you have, the particular image that you have. Learn their properties, their characteristics, the representation. And that, <laughs> that image then can then provide a lot more than one could imagine. Um, so I hope to explain a little bit about what I mean during this conversation. Um, I did I did one several months ago about Jizo um, Bodhisattva, um, and we'll run through kind of a similar program in terms of uh, themes of exploration, right? So we'll look at representations, certain mudras that are associated, um, particular markings to identify <laughs> Yashin Yorai, um, attendee, attendance, and, and what are the main characteristics. I mean, frankly, I have a lot to say, uh, I wanted to say, I will want to say, um, but I had to really limit myself based on the conversation. Um, so I'm sure there will be things that I haven't mentioned, um, and I, but I really wanted to round out some of the meaning and symbolism um, of this particular Buddha, especially within Tendai and really how Yakshi Nyorai fits into all of our lives. So the next slide. So here they are, um, Baijia Jaguru in Sanskrit, Yao Shi Fu in Chinese, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, Yakshi Myorai and, and the Medicine Buddha. I'll, I'll be referring to uh, them mostly in a gender neutral way and mostly as Yakshi Myorai. Um, so translate as you need to see fit. But there are a lot of names. Um, the Buddha of Medicine and, and Healing, Medicine Teacher, Lord of the Eastern Paradise of Pure Lapis Lazuli, <coughs> Master of Healing, King of Lapis Lazuli Radiance Tathagata, commonly referred to as the Medicine Buddha. So the image is, uh, acts as a, a form of doctor who cures dukkha, our suffering or our discontentedness, and using the medicine of his teachings. He can cure all manner of illness, um, especially ignorance spiritual ignorance. Um, and that in and of itself, ignorance is the most fundamental illness and source of all dukkha within um, Buddhism. And we can imagine that this representation had a huge influence on many Buddhist followers. Being a master of healing, um, a manifestation of an ultimate physician and healer would have been, and I might argue still is, a really attractive trait. Us. Slide, please. And just as an aside, to explain some of the names for a second, the use of lapis lazuli is, is particular here. Um, <clears throat> lapis comes from a particular mine um, from what is now southern Afghanistan, and it's been revered for several thousands of years, um, so it was not new with Buddhism. However, we can imagine that based on the rarity of this blue color in nature, its occurrence would have been a wonder to see. The only other blue in nature uh, that we could equate it to is the sky, and probably huge bodies of water, although there are very few of those in that area of the world, if you, if you know. Um, therefore, lapis lazuli, loosely translated, implies a stone from the skies or from the heavens. Um, and it's occasionally speckled with pyrite, which, is, uh, which only increased its perceived value, helping in the depiction of something almost cosmologic. Um, and Yachimurai is the only um, Buddha associated with the color and stone, and hence the characterization that, his, that their eastern paradise, over which they preside, is made completely out of this precious stone. But the history and use of lapis is, is a whole other conversation. We could get into it at some other point if you're interested, let me know. 
um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, we also see in this slide on the right the Sanskrit bija um, associated with Yashin Yorai, and it's Bai. Uh, this seed bija uh, also, uh, uh, as well no, uh, as with all bija associated with a Buddha or Bodhisattva, are also meant to be a representation of that image, meant to evoke the same characteristics as a drawn or sculpted depiction. This could be enshrined as a Hanzong, um, uh, as an image, as the main image, as it is, because it is said that from this seed, Bija, all manner of Yakshi Nyorai ness comes forth. And Bai is the first syllable of the Sanskrit name, Bai Shija Guru, and mantra, Om Bai Shaje, Bai Shaje, Bai Shaja, Samyudgate Svaha. However, these images um, of Yachin Yorai are rarely seen in India and Southeast Asia um, because primarily the figure is, uh, really takes prominence in the Mahayana. Um, therefore, we see an increased emergence of, the, of their image throughout um, the 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries um, CE, uh, particularly in, in Tibet and China, where they become much more frequent. And the, the images themselves don't vary too much. Unlike uh, many other members of the Buddhist pantheon they, uh, um, who may have numerous variations and, uh, to their depictions, uh, Yakshin Yorai tends to be pretty um, standard. Slide, please. So in Tibet, um, on the right, you'll see uh, Yakshin Yorai is depicted as being blue, lapis lazuli. We also see um, their blue being represented in other ways, um, as we know from our own Honzon in the Hondo, whose hair is colored lapis lazuli. Otherwise, as an image, they're usually seated, as most um, uh, heavenly Buddhas are, um, although uh, we'll see some variations later. And often, Yakshin Yorai is surrounded by their seven, uh, their seven forms, each representing the various qualities of Yakshin Yorai. So, um, we can see those in the aura um, around the figure on the left, and then more clearly in the, in the Tibetan um, form on the right. Um, the right hand is palm out, either raised or open um, outward. And this, uh, this is termed the fear not mudra, the simui in. Um, and the left hand is um, out in front, palm up, or held in the lap almost meditatively. <coughs> Um, and this, uh, uh, this one is the wish-giving mudra, the yogani. Um, however, from the Han era onwards, in Japan particularly, they appear more often with uh, that same left hand out, palm up, but with a medicine bowl left in, in the left hand. Um, and the bowl often contains anything that would have a, anything medicinal in it. When, and when in temples, when enshrined in temples, Yakshin Yorai is often surrounded by other figures. Most of the time, they are flanked by statues of the 12 heavenly generals, which representing one of Yakshin Yorai's 12 great vows. Uh, as a bodhisattva, before their Buddhahood, they made 12 great vows, all of which were meant to cure all sentient beings and to help lead them to awakening. So then the depictions of the generals are representative of those vows. Um, other times, Yakshin Yorai is flanked by his acolytes, um, siblings, uh, Niko and, and Gakko. So Niko, the sunlight bodhisattva on the left, um, and on the right, Gakko, the moonlight um, bodhisattva. They're, they're also, also termed um, so, uh, what is it, solar radiance bodhisattva or lunar radiance bodhisattva. Um, and this one in particular um, is found at Todaiji, which is a very popular temple in, in Nara. It's also where the Daibutsu Dainichi Nyoren is. It's about a five to ten, six meter tall Buddha. It's amazing. Um, slide, please. So, although Yakshin Yorei's popularity uh, has been primarily in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, there's, and there's very little direct mention or depiction of them in early Nikaya Buddhism, a, a healing figure would always be popular. Healing and curing all manner of diseases on all level of all levels, body, mind, spirit, would have held high importance. Um, this concept of healing is universal and wide-reaching in its influence within many faith traditions. 
Jesus' miracles of healing as an example. Remember, it, it was after the experience that then Siddhartha Gautama had when he witnessed a sick man. This becomes one of the catalytic, catalytic events that awakened the young prince to the problem of human suffering and inspired him to, become, uh, to begin his spiritual research. Out of dukkha came the need to heal. And so within the Pali Canon, we see explicitly a list um, of four requisites for living, especially for monastics, namely robes, clothing, food, nourishment, uh, lodging, shelter, and medicine. Again, primarily the focus of healing in Buddhism was that of ignorance. However, the body too had to be cared for. How could an, an ascetic uh, experience their uh, austerities fully if the body was not healthy? There was a large emphasis on noticing disease and illness and taking the right action to alleviate um, or cure such hindrances. There are even strict guidelines offered, with, uh, offered within the Pali Canon as to how to live one's life to best avoid illness so that they could be healed on all those levels, body, mind, and spirit. In so doing, monastics would have had a lot of experience in healing practices. And if they were within a community, they would have turn, been turned to as kind of a de facto physician by default. However, the Vinaya had specific rules as to not, to not use those skills for trade, um, meaning you couldn't offer medicine in order to get better alms in your begging, right? So it wasn't a tit for tat. But at the same time, there were um, expectations that one should help if they could. It was meant to be given freely and to alleviate the suffering of all. And in that time of healing, the Dharma would have been shared and discussed and given to those being cared for. It was a way to transmit the Dharma. Shakyamuni Buddha had many stories told of his ability to heal the sick and is seen as having medicinal powers. Various tales of his healing acts are rampant throughout the Pali Canon. And in fact, Shakyamuni Buddha was often venerated during the early Nikaya Buddhism for those healing prospects. And I personally think, and this is my own editorial, Shakyamuni Buddha would have been a figure <laughs> to pray to for healing. And, and after his peri nirvana, after we got, uh, we got further from the historical figure, a Yakshinyurai character would have been only natural to, uh, to have been developed. Almost as if Shakyamuni was a physical manifestation of all the Buddha's particular characteristics. Remember, all these numerous Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that we talk about um, are, are all manifestations of um, numerous acts, aspects of the complete supreme awakening, Anyuta Asamgak Sambodhi. And, and so their qualities are access points to tap into that true nature of reality. Shakyamuni Buddha, as, the, as a physical being, therefore, may have been more a, a more pluralistic conduit to all those numerous qualities. And as time went on, each quality develops into an individualized form, hence the development of someone like uh, an image like Yakshinyore. And I might also add here that a lot of the images that we see, and in particular this one, um, they equate Shakyamuni Buddha and, and uh, Yakshin Yorai um, in, in their manner of representation. They're very similar. Um, we can see here uh, Shakyamuni has his hand up in that same um, fear not mudra, semui in mudra, um, and, and has that same um, uh, wish giving mudra in his lap. And so, and oftentimes Shakyamuni Buddha with his left hand is pointing down towards the ground. It's, it's a receiving of dukkha and a transmission down towards the ground, grounding it out. But point being here is that many of the representations um, depict the same meaning. They're both someone to go to for healing. Because as it's described in so many ways, Shakyamuni Buddha was providing the, the world a way to heal. His expounding of the Four Noble Truths, for example, is a form of healing. He's naming the illness and making the diagnosis. 
He's identifying the problem, <coughs> providing hope and solace, and offering the medicine in the form of the Eightfold Path. The providing of the Dharma is seen as a medicine to our samsaric state, this cycle of rebirth. As we experience it, the Dharma helps us to heal from that. This concept of healing our ignorance is at the root of Buddhist practice, and I might argue at the base of our humanness. As time went on, the teaching spread and the practice broadened and deepened, and the Mahayana, and the Mahayana took shape. We start to see numerous figures, figures develop, one of which being Yakshinyorai. And again, knowing that this uh, healing concept held such importance historically, as Yui Suzuki puts it, Yakshinyorai played a prominent role in East Asia since the 3rd century CE. The cults surrounding the deity first flourished in China from the late 6th to 8th century, and it was then transmitted first to the Korean Peninsula and later to the Japanese archipelago. Although the cult of Yakshi um, arrived much later in Japan than on the continent, it became a dominant force in Japanese Buddhism. We'll get to Japan, uh, Japan in a second, but personally, I find the evolution of the Yakshin Yorai figure into Tibet and China fascinating. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm an acupuncturist, and so I, having, it, having the medicine come from China, we work with a lot of imbalances or, or this flow of energy in the body. And, uh, and this concept of um, that the, within Tibet and China at this time, there were a lot of ritualized, almost cosmic healing practices um, as a way to um, heal the body in, in, in esoteric ways. And they were already embedded within the culture. So then with the advent of, of Yashi to, uh, to that would only make sense. It's, it's been thought that, that within that culture that the ultimate expression of health would be ultimate awakening, a sage-like state um, where all was in balance and therefore no illness, therefore beyond a mortal experience. It would imply a state of not experiencing dukkha, which is virtually impossible. But that, that mystic sense of, of health made sense to a lot of early Tibetan and Chinese philosophers and thinkers. And, and if this would ultimate physician image was a way to experience that healthy state, then emphasizing an image like Yashinyore would, would be expected. Besides, as we get away from uh, monastic Buddhism in um, much of what is now India and Southeast Asia, the teachings would have been shared with monastics and lay people alike along the Silk Road. And thus, a medicine Buddha figure would be attracted to both groups. So the establishment of a Yakshin Yorai cult would make sense. It would have been super popular. And as Suzuki mentions, this helps Yakshin Yorai arrive um, in Japan during the early Nara period, while Buddhism as a whole is being introduced. Slide, please. Therefore, by the time it reached Saicho, Yakshin Yorai's influence would have already been well established. And as, um, and as Yakshin Yorai uh, is the purveyor over the Eastern Paradise, this almost destines Japan to have an affinity for Yakshi from the start. However, Saicho continued that devotion by putting emphasis on the qualities the Yakshin Yorai manifested for the benefit of the emperor and the court, and for all of Japan. The first statue Saicho carved to be enshrined on Mount Hie was a standing Yakshin Yorai. Yui Suzuki argues that Saicho um, was contending with Shingon in Kukai, and so um, purposefully chose to make the Yakshi image standing, as opposed to the traditional seated position. It was seen as a more proactive and more engaged in the ongoings of the world kind of stance. In our uh, previous discussions, we've alluded to the societal tumult that was going on in Japan at the time, the degradation of the Buddhist teachings through Mapo, etc. And so <coughs> Saicho's choice of the Yakshinyorai image would have been very deliberate as a means to help heal and protect. By the 8th and 9th centuries, the majority of state-sponsored temples enshrined Yakshinyorai as their homes on, their main image, 
and the state relied predominantly on Yakshi repentance rites to protect the welfare of the nation. At the same time, monks and social elites across Japan helped popularize Yakshi faith. Suzuki writes that Yakshi's spread was primarily controlled and aimed at the elite. And it, although she says very little about Yakshi's eventual reception by the common folk, um, or of the deity's diminished role in the post Heian religious matrix, which emphasized Buddhism for the commoners, and those being the development of the Kamakura schools, be, namely being Pure Land, Nichiren, and Zen schools, etc. But at one time, much of the cult following rivaled only that of Amitabha, of Amida. On the one hand, one of the healer, and on the other, the consoler. Regardless of the waning popularity of Yakshi Myorai cult, there has been an indelible mark left on Japanese culture. And Suzuki's main thesis is that Saicho, the founder of Tendai, and Tendai as a whole, had a large role to play in that. The sheer number of temples still devoted to Yakshi Myorai are numerous, because one cannot de detract from the importance that healing has upon the psyche of the masses. So what can we take from all this? As mentioned before, cosmologically, Yakshi Myorai dwells in the eastern direction, of which there are ten. So if we think of the eight cardinal, uh, eight cardinal directions, uh, northeast, southwest, and then northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest, um, and then above and below, right, the z-axis, that's ten directions. Within his realm, numerous multiples of other Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, deities, uh, heavenly beings, guardians, etc., all manifesting the qualities of healing and medicine. Here's this whole section of our cosmology devoted to our health and healing. This spans through all aspects of medicine and health that we've already discussed, and way more others beyond that, others beyond our comprehension. Yakshi Myorai, this bija, this mantra, are representations of that entirety. We cannot undervalue its importance within our Buddhist practice. Raoul Bin, uh, Birnbaum uh, wrote a book called The Healing Buddha, by, by, published by Shambhala Press, and in it he explains, quote, in teachings found in Pali Canon as well as in Mahayana scriptures, one of the most important aspects of the healing process is the conversion of suffering into an aspiration to attain enlightenment. Time and time again, we read of instances where the experience of disease or disaster is transformed through new spiritual awareness into a fundamental event in which devotion arises and is intensified. Energy is channeled into a sincere plea for aid. And the course of life is profoundly changed. This is a special characteristic of Shakyamuni's treatments of ill monks recorded in the Pali Canon of Vimlakirti's sage advice in the Vimlakirti Nirdesa Sutra, and, and of the scriptures on, on the healing Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Lotus Sutra equates the healer um, with the teacher of the law, and the special scriptures on the healing Buddhas and Bodhisattvas similarly hold that most profound healing process is spiritual healing, taking place on an interior plane. This healing is the, is the gradual elimination of the three inner poisons, lust, anger, and delusion, as well as the removal of karmic veils of obstructions that have been built up through thoughts, words, deeds of many lifetimes. Healing in this sense is a powerful transforma a transformative process that leads ultimately to direct apprehension of big R reality, to the awakened state. 
enlightenment. End quote. Birth, illness, <laughs> right? It's all there. Like when we talk about birth, illness, old age, they are an inevitable part of our cycle of rebirth. Yes. And until we can escape that, we need Yakshinyodai. We need those qualities. We all experience dukkha. Or at least, I assume we're all experiencing that, and if you're not, please let us know. Um, <laughs> but we all have it. We all have it. And here, I steal from some of my acupuncture scripts that I use with patients, because I have to explain, you. there may be an illness. There is a disease. But learn about it. Grapple with it. Find what works. What hinders? Get engaged with it. You have a choice. Learn from it or not. Ignor ignoring is ignorance. If you can learn from it, then you can wear the condition better. It doesn't mean cure it. It means being your best because of it. Some of my healthiest patients have the worst conditions because they've had to learn how to take care of themselves. If they ignore it, their quality of life decreases. So they're forced to deal with it and they make healthier choices because of it. So I say again, we can choose to learn our lessons from illnesses. Dukkha, what have you, or not. Why do I do so many bad things to myself? Why do I do that? I can't believe I did it. Why do I do that? Why, 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 why? Who cares why? Ask yourself, how do we best move forward? Why look back at why? Why is presumptuous? How do we take what we have, what we are, and use it to its fullest? Make the best out of what we got. Learn from it so that we can wear this bag of skin better. How do we use our dukkha to rise above it? How does dukkha help become the raft to the other shore? Illness can help us turn to the light. If we pay attention, it can be our best teacher. We are marked by dukkha. It doesn't make it, it doesn't make sense to work with it <laughs> rather than fight it or ignore it. That's, that's Yakshin Yorai. That's the vibe. How, how do we heal? In all ways, if we access that Yakshin Yorai quality, we can start to heal our wounds. I think of the, the trend of folks being triggered uh, or running away from difficult conversations, whether it be about racism or climate crisis, what have you. It's tough. We don't want to admit things. And but how, how else do we heal it? I, I know it doesn't make sense, but I, John Stewart was on The Late Show the other night with Stephen Colbert. Um, and he was on it talking about Jewish tropes and that we're seeing in a lot of people, of um, popular, famous uh, basketball players and, and musicians and things coming out with very anti Semitic things. Um, but he talks about how these are harsh topics and we have to hash them out. Otherwise, we retreat to our own self-affirming groups and assume that we're the right ones. No. No. He says, quote, the only way to heal a wound is to open it up and cleanse it. And that stings. That hurts. But you have to expose it to air. 
And I'm afraid that the general tenor of conversation in this country is to cover it up, bury it, put it on the outskirts, and don't deal with it. End quote. Ignoring is ignorance. I have to say that me falling on this snippet of the show was completely random, but while it was while I was researching for this discussion, <laughs> so I was steeped in everything Yakshi Myorai, and here was this snippet of a clip, and yeah, there it is. That's a great example of Yakshi Myorai. I'm not saying that John Stewart is Yakshi Myorai, please, but <laughs> that's the quality. It's a plea to wake up, to open our wounds, to in investigate it, which stings, cleanse it, stings again, apply some healing salve. Yep, that hurts too. It's, it's not easy, but it's worth it. That's, that's Yakshi Norai. <laughs> it's our ability to be healed, of our dukkha and to awaken to the true nature of reality. Oh, Mrs. Amy says, Amy says, just somebody got this one. Um, let's next slide, please. Um, and before I open it up to <laughs> questions, comments, and thoughts, uh, is Ishuna Sensei in, I don't the, think in the chat? Uh, no, he, he joined if, the if he Are is. Going? Please feel free to chime in. Sensei, do you do you have anything you would like to add? Um, oh, thank you. Oh, you're um, oh yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Yakshin Yura is a central deity of Mount Hiei at the Kompontudo, as you know. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> Nara, uh, there is a very beautiful Yakshin Yura and Gak. Uh, Nikko Bosatsu, Gakko Bosatsu, Sangha Goddess, uh, Sangha and uh, uh, Moon God. So uh, I think Yakshi is a healing Buddha, and the uh, many people of the ancient they would like to be saved out of uh, difficulties. And so Yakshi uh, Nyorai's Goshingon mantra. Samudugate, uh, that is the name of the god, but the, the, which means to get rid of all the, uh, <clears throat> what should I say, sufferings. And so many people wish, wish the, the sun, uh, sunshine, will bless us and also get away from uh, many diseases. So, and the symbol became Yakshi. Yakshi is a Vaishaja guru, a medicine. Med doctor of medicine, so doctor of medicine Buddha uh, figured, and uh, so Saicho, founder of Japanese uh, Tendai, first he carved Yakshin Yorai, and uh, that is a central deity, and also uh, Tendai Mission of Hawaii, where I was there uh, almost uh, 50 years ago, uh, I took, I, I moved uh, uh, the uh, uh, image of Yakshinurai from Nikko, you know, Yomeimon. There is very beautiful gate, Yomeimon and Nikko. And uh, the second floor of the Yomeimon, uh, there was uh, Yakshinurai, but the, after a major period, uh, uh, that Japanese, uh, what should I say, uh, shrine and Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism and Shintoism separated. And so Yakshi Nyorai's uh, image moved to uh, Rinnoji Temple in Nikko. And so the first when uh, Tendai Mission of Hawaii established, uh, I, uh, I brought it to uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, uh, so Yakshi is a very interesting and very um, meaningful uh, Tathagata, I think. That is my uh, thought now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank sensei. you, Sensei. Um, Thank you, Sensei.